Thank you for those of you who have uh, had the, fort, uh, the strength to come to the sixth lecture also. Um, I found during the fifth lecture that uh, some of the students qu from our questions made me realize that I should probably reintroduce the basic experiments, experimental system that uh, we are talking about. Uh, excuse me, can you make this full screen, please? Yeah, all right. It will yes. go. Still, it will go. Just a second. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So, just to make it very clear, uh, we are talking about um, disordered electronic systems, and the prototypical system that that we'll use is phosphorus doped silicon. Uh, there are other systems, uh, and I have shown data on other systems as well, and I'll show that there is similarity in certain regards. But the reason we do phosphorus doped silicon is because we understand the phosphorus impurity in silicon very well, and we have a good microscopic Hamiltonian in many cases for this system. Uh, so just to recap, when you put an impurity like phosphorus in silicon, phosphorus has one extra electron and one extra nuclear charge. And so all the other electrons, other than that one extra one, go into the bonding into silicon, and that's what uh, shown here schematically with a square lattice. Of course, silicon is, a, uh, uh, is not two-dimensional at all, uh, but uh, phosphorus is shown as a positive nucleus, and the extra electron is in a hydrogenic orbit around the, around the um, phosphorus dopant, and the wave function is actually given as a product of the wave function at the conduction band minimum, multiplied by a hydrogenic envelope, which satisfies basically a hydrogenic uh, equation. There are uh, things like mass and isotropy and multiple valleys and things like that that we understand quite well. But the most important thing to realize is that because of the dielectric constant of the silicon and the small mass compared to free electrons, this, the effective Rydberg of this hydrogen atom is 10 to 30 millivolts in silicon is 30. And the Bohr radius is 20 angstroms in silicon and 50 angstroms in germanium. It can be 500 angstroms in indium antimonide, for example. So it's much, much larger than the lattice constant. And so the fact that this, some of these impurities are substitutional, um, the discrete substitutional uh, places don't play any role. You can think of them as essentially in continuum. So that's one thing. The second thing that uh, I want to remind you from last, uh, from Tuesday's lecture, is that if you have a pair of impurities, they're like two hydrogen atoms or the hydrogen molecule problem. And in the hydrogen molecule problem, the ground state is given by a singlet state, uh, magnetically spin zero state, whereas the excited state is triplet. And if you're only interested, uh, and the typical distance in phosphorus doped silicon that we're talking about is way in the tail here. Um, it's nowhere near equilibrium distance for the hydrogen molecule. Of course, the impure phosphorus impurities are not allowed to move. They are where they are. And so uh, in that regime, between quantum chemical calculations and the asymptotic result due to Herring and Flicker, we understand the exchange interaction very well between two hydrogen atoms. And it's always antiferromagnetic. That's actually a theorem. And so you end up having a ground state that's a singlet, an excited state that's a triplet. Um, the other thing that's very uh, different about this system compared to most other magnetic systems is that the, even the nearest neighbor exchange interaction is distributed over many orders of magnitude. So here's an actual calculation for phosphorus doped silicon at a concentration that's about five uh, times lower than the metal insulator transition density. And what you find is the nearest neighbor exchange can be as high as 300 Kelvin and as low as a milli Kelvin, depending on what the distance to the nearest neighbor is, because it's a Poisson distributed system like an ideal gas. And as a result of that, and also the fact that these are quantum spin half system with Heisenberg exchange, you find that the susceptibility of such a system seems to follow roughly a power law in temperature. 
And that's the data right here. The only thing that was adjusted in this is uh, the bore radius. And the bore radius obtained this way agreed with that that was obtained by fitting the optical data for the 1s to 2p transition. So that's uh, it's OK. So that sort of sets the stage. Uh, on Tuesday, I went through the magnetic properties in the insulating phase. And bottom line is that you get a susceptibility that's diverging at zero temperature. And you get a magnetization curve that is that is nonlinear as a function of field, but it's not given by a Brillouin function either. Uh, and um, a, a theory that in, involves the exchange interactions uh, using large disorder renormalization group actually fits the data quantitatively. Okay, so now I want to go to higher densities. I want to go to densities beyond the metal insulator transition. So the question is, what is going to happen? So if you look at the phase diagram for the uniform system, so imagine the phosphorus atoms were on a super lattice, either a simple cubic super lattice or a BCC super lattice, uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, and if you look at the general phase diagram as a function of concentration of these uh, phosphorus impurities, so as the concentration increases, the average distance of the uh, uh, super lattice cell decreases in size, what happens is you get an antiferromagnetic insulator at low densities, basically the, um, the nearest neighbor uh, spins are arranged antiferromagnetically, so you get an arrangement that looks something like that, just in a two-dimensional projection, and it continues. And that's an insulating state. And it turns out that actually there's a transition to a metallic state, but the metal continues to be antiferromagnetic. And finally, you get a transition to a paramagnetic metal. Okay. And in the antiferromagnetic insulator, you can write down the standard susceptibility as a Curie law, Weiss law. On the other hand, on the metallic side, especially in the paramagnet, you can write the susceptibility as a Pauli. Uh, susceptibility. The energy scale, instead of being uh, the Curie-Weiss temperature is actually the Fermi energy. It really gets quenched. So here, it's a very smooth crossover in terms of uh, um, the magnetic behavior. Now, the question is, what happens for randomly distributed sites? We already know that uh, in this insulator, the susceptibility is going, so this is log chi versus log d, and I'm plotting something that is a power law, so a straight line on this curve, and the susceptibility is going to infinity for all densities in the insulating phase. And that I called, uh, it's called the random singlet phase or the valence bond insulator uh, uh, or valence bond glass. The susceptibility um, is diverging everywhere there. And of course, at very high densities, one expects kinetic energy is going to be the most important term in the, in the electrons uh, gas. And therefore, one would expect Pauli susceptibility coming uh, at very high densities. And so the question, how do we match this constant susceptibility for a Pauli metal with this diverging susceptibility of the insulator? And one might think, all right, that maybe what you have is a susceptibility that actually um, um, is temperature dependent at high temperature. And then depending on how far you are from the metal insulator transition, it becomes constant at low temperatures. And so in this case, I've drawn three densities, N1, N2, and N3 that are above the metal insulator transition, where N3 is greater than N2 is greater than N1. So basically you're trying to sum out the other smoothly cross over from the insulating behavior to the metallic behavior. And that was originally the idea we had, uh, uh, because if that is the case, we know the crossover temperature will give us a critical exponent characteristic of the, of the metal insulator transition. And this is something that is also sort of expected if you have, um, um, if you do a, a theory that was done by Brinkman and Rice, um, in the old days. Okay. So without, you know, of course, that's all what we are thinking, but what does the experiment tell us? What is the real truth? And so the answer turns out here is completely different. So on the left is phosphorus doped silicon. This is the 
uh, query susceptibility. And here are two samples that are 9% uh, uh, and 25% above the metal insulated transition. So instead of going constant at low temperatures, actually tending to go up. There's again a logarithmic plot. So there's quite a lot of enhancement of the susceptibility. A few years later, uh, that was data due to Miko Palanen and Bell Labs. There was also work done by Hirsch and Holcomb and, and Miko uh, on phosphorus and boron dope silicon. And here you see the susceptibility for something that is 80% above the metal insulator transition. And again, the susceptibility at low temperatures seems to be diverging. It is not constant by any means. Here's 10% about the transition. That's in the insulator. So it's, you know, almost if I were looking at very low temperatures at 10 millikelvin, I wouldn't know where the transition was. The magnetic behavior is again saying, we don't know what the, where the transition is taking place. Whereas of course, in conductivity, the transition is extremely visible. So we have to try and understand why this kind of behavior happens. So the first approach we took was just a phenomenological approach. We said, let's assume that the disordered electron gas in the metallic phase close to the metal insulator transition actually consists of two fluids, sort of an idea from helium that there are itinerant electrons and localized spins. So the localized spins are sort of mimicking what's happening in the insulator and the itinerant electrons are giving some kind of a Pauli susceptibility and a linear term in, in specific heat, all the rest of it. So if that were the case, one could write down the, uh, if you look at, define the gamma coefficient, which is basically specific heat divided by temperature. And in a, in a Fermi liquid, this is a constant. Uh, one can write that constant uh, as a sum of two terms. One is a term that is just um, a mass enhanced uh, Fermi liquid. And then there's a second term, which is divergent because it's the insulating spins that are uh, exchange coupled spins that are creating this uh, uh, contribution. And one can write a similar formula for the susceptibility. There's a mass enhancement. Uh, and then there's again, a divergent form, which is due to the localized spins, which are exchange coupled. And one of the things that's interesting is that if you take this two fluid model, we know because we know the um, more model for the insulator very well, we know how this beta depends on this coefficient alpha. We have a formula for it. And so once you have, if you know that, that means that if you try to plot gamma, the enhancement of the, of the specific heat coefficient relative to free electrons and a plot it uh, versus the enhancement of the susceptibility, you should get a universal curve, which should not depend on where you are near the transition, because basically that, that's being taken care of in these parameters, M stars and, and T naughts. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So you have to make a product of alpha for both the gamma and the chi. Exactly. That comes out of this ex exchange couple spin yeah, and, model. And, and think about what does that do in its range? No, nothing, it's nothing. Uh, well, the only strange thing is that when alpha goes towards one, it goes to infinity. Oh, okay. So, but, but we are not at alpha equals one. We are at. But uh, as you go through the metal interior transition. Right. Identify the What's mm -hmm. alpha doing? It's smooth. It's smooth. Okay, so we're basically saying yeah. what's happening is that there's an ins there's sort of an insulating part to the to the uh, system which doesn't really see the thing. The, tra the transition is happening in the uh, in the Fermi liquid part of it, the one that develops and delocalizes. Yeah, well, probably get to one or something that you do deep in the metallic phase. No, we don't. We assume that we are not going deep in the metallic phase. We only st uh, stay close to the metal insulator so where this holds, where, where we claim this holds. Okay. So if you do that, um, you actually 
what I've done is I have plotted the actual data of chi over chi naught versus gamma over gamma naught. That's these points. And these are taken from samples that are close to the metal insulator transition and for all temperatures that they, uh, so we're basically taking data from two different uh, concentrations and all temp low temperatures. And what you can see is that the data by themselves say that there is some universal curve. Then the question is, how do you explain this universal curve? And let me just go through these different lines that are there. Okay, there is a line that I call BR, which is basically Brinkman and Rice uh, result. Okay, in, in our, we try and um, say that there's some enhancement of the mass and, and uh, there's a fourfold enhancement of the Wilson ratio. And that's what Brinkman and Rice uh, would predict. There's another one, which I call BL, which is the dashed line here. That is assuming it's just an insulator that there is no, no contribution coming from the Fermi liquid, okay? Um, then, um, um, and as I said, the two fluid model would say, add the, the BL stands for button leak, uh, add the in insulating behavior to a firm and mass enhanced Fermi liquid. And the mass enhancement, actually, we don't adjust. We take it from, there were Japanese measurements on phosphorus dope silicon um, in the range one to two uh, NC uh, from the 1960s and 70s. And that, that number is something like two, two and a half or something like that. And we just took it, whatever it was. Uh, and when you add the two, you find that the data exactly goes over the Thing. There's no adjustable parameters because alpha has already been determined from the insulator. Beta of alpha is known. So we know exactly that curve. There is no adjustable parameter left. There are also long wavelength theories based on scaling ideas for interacting electrons. And they give different results depending on whether you believe it's uh, you consider phosphorus dope silicon to be a single valley semiconductor or many valley semiconductor. I can go through those arguments later uh, if someone's interested after the lecture is over. But no matter which one you take, um, what, you don't manage to fit the data. Basically, what the data is saying is that the susceptibility is getting enhanced much, much more than the specific heat is getting enhanced. Because if you look at the numbers, specific heat, uh, the susceptibility is enhanced by a factor of 30 or so, whereas uh, the enhancement of the specific heat is only five or six. So there's a significant more enhancement of the susceptibility. And that's something that doesn't come out of normal long wavelength type of approaches. Dope silicon, yes. This data is from only for phosphorus dope silicon. We have not analyzed the data for, for boron and phosphorus dope silicon, partly because we don't have the specific heat data for that. We need both specific heat and, uh, and uh, susceptibility. And uh, John Grabner, who was measuring the specific heat, did measure. It's really hard to measure specific heat because specific heat is going down as you go down in temperature. But, but he did a very good job. Uh, and we have a whole fissure of letter on that showing that you get specific heat is not going linear in temperature, it's going as a sublinear power of temperature. There's very good evidence for that. In fact, the, yeah. Uh, it, was, it will change a little bit, yes. Right, that's what, uh, yes. And we'll have to take that into account when someone may measure the specific heat of uh, phosphorus and boron dope silicon. Uh, one of the messages of these lectures is that it is really important to do a comprehensive set of experiments and then do theory along with it <coughs> if you want to get at the truth. If you don't want, you know, you, you can always get a theory and fit some part of the data and leave, leave the rest of it out. And that was often done in that. Here we have sort of, this is one system where we have got complete experimental data, not only susceptibility, we have the full magnetization curves, we have the specific heat, we have the conductivity, everything is there in the same set of samples. 
optical conductivity too, you know, finite frequency. To me, the most interesting uh, plot is this one, which is not plotting the susceptibility enhancement, not as a function of gamma, but as a function of conductivity enhancement compared to Boltzmann, okay? And what you find is that this curve is literally experimentally vertical, which is saying that whatever is causing the susceptibility enhancement is doing nothing to the conductivity. And that's why the, that's why the two fluid model works so well is because the conductivity is all determined by the itinerant electrons and the magnetism is mostly at low temperatures determined by the localized spins. And again, if you would try to do a scaling theory, uh, which involves only long wavelength physics and basically only, only charge and spin coupled excitations that are coupled and of one kind, you find that you just cannot do that. If you're gonna have enhancement of the susceptibility, you better have change in the conductivity. And we're not talking about a lot of change, we're talking about 100% you know, change, whereas the, um, is an order of magnitude in susceptibility. Okay, and it's nothing like that. This, this curve for all practical purposes is vertical. So this tells me, you know, it was this curve actually that gave me the idea that we should have a two fluid model. The magnetism and conductor uh, DC transport are not really related that much. Uh, these data are taken at uh, below um, 100 millikelvin. Any temperature below 100 millikelvin. So now we have to try and understand why we are having, uh, you know, localized moments in the metal. And that was uh, uh, something that I had hoped at that stage that we could try and do a calculation for the disordered Hubbard model, like Patrick and I had done for the Heisenberg, random Heisenberg model. But uh, it turned out that that was uh, very difficult. And so at that time, I, so we said there was uh, a postdoc at Bell Labs and he and I were working together. We started doing it and then he moved to Yale and recruited uh, uh, a graduate student, uh, uh, Milicha, who, uh, and with Milicha and Subir, uh, we explored a different way of looking at the problem. And what we did was we, we said we are going to look at the disordered Hubbard model and rather than using some kind of renormalization group technique, we're going to try and do an appro approximate job of this. Now what is done, if you look at scaling theories of localization with or without interactions, is what they do is they do disorder to lowest order in disorder. And then they find that they have to sum up all orders in interactions. And this is something that turned out to be somewhat of a surprise in the early stages, but it turns out that that's what you have to do. So in some sense, the disorder is treated only perturbatively or to lowest order, but interactions are treated exactly within that framework of lowest order disorder. We took the opposite approach. We said, we are going to treat the disorder exactly numerically, but we are gonna treat the interactions in a Hartree-Fock approximation, okay? So what we did was we took this particular Hamiltonian where we consider phosphorus sites and there's a hopping between one phosphorus site and the other. And you can see for hydrogen atoms, the, ex, the hopping integral is exponentially dependent. Uh, we just took the number that is used, that Mott used, for example. Uh, and this is in Rydberg units. And it turns out that the, the U for hydrogenic centers is almost one Rydberg because the H minus is barely bound. It's point of, as I showed, it's bound only by 0.05 Rydbergs. So uh, the U uh, on a hydro, uh, for any hydrogenic system is almost one Rydberg. So we took it to be one because we didn't expect our numbers are gonna be so, um, you know, quantitative. We just wanted to get the right answer, roughly the right answer. And the way you do this uh, treatment is, of course, this is a many body problem. You, you've got uh, um, electrons on the same site have a, have a repulsion U. It's, of course, not taking the full Coulomb interaction, it's just taking on-site interaction. And 
what you do is you try and find the best one electron Hamiltonian that you can that matches this actual Hamiltonian. And the way you do it is you use what's, uh, we are very used to taking a variational wave function and trying to uh, match the ground state energy. This is a finite temperature extension of that. And um, for example, a statistical physics book by Feynman tells you that the free energy of the real system is bounded by the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the, in the, in the ensemble of the effective, this effective one electron Hamiltonian, a minus T times the entropy of this effective Hamiltonian. Okay, now this Hamiltonian is one electron, so we can do any kind of things with it. The real problem is the uh, real Hamiltonian is sitting, uh, has a electron-electron um, interaction only on site, but still it does have that. And it gets, on, it's only this part, and that can be done because we know the Hamiltonian, we know the, uh, the ensemble for the effective Hamiltonian at any given temperature, and we can calculate. And the way we do it is we say that, well, we'll have, uh, these are these um, epsilon i tildes uh, that are free parameters in the system. H i's are effective fields on the spins at each side side. And these are, these, uh, that's our choice. And we will choose them so that the right-hand side is going to be <coughs> minimized. So we hope that it comes very close to the true free energy. So that's, it's a variational calculation. So, you know, it may be good, it may be bad, at least it's variational. So this is actually a generalization of the a model that uh, Anderson and Peter Wolf uh, solved many, many years ago. They basically considered a cubic lattice uh, with an on-site um, Hubbard um, U and some hopping T. And in particular, Peter Wolf's um, uh, model was that maybe we uh, consider a site which has a smaller hopping. So it is somewhat isolated from, from the other sites. And this is not a bad uh, picture that we have because what is giving these susceptibility at low temperature are local moments that are weakly coupled to the rest of the sites, okay? So when you go through this calculation, and this is a very old calculation done in the 60s, what you find is that as you go from high temperature to low temperatures, you are, there are two possible regimes. One regime is where the uh, W is large, and then this site becomes part of the Fermi liquid, and you get a direct transition from high temperature susceptibility to a Pauli susceptibility. On the other hand, if W is very small, what happens is that uh, the system forms a local moment on that site and the susceptibility gets enhanced by a factor of two because two of the states are taken away from there, uh, from the four possible states on that site. And then only very, very low temperature, which is not captured by Hartree-Fock, the, the local moment gets quenched and you get a condo effect, what's, what's known as a condo effect and get no susceptibility out. So we're going to now apply this idea to this random ensemble, okay? And as far as our calculation is concerned, we are only going to uh, try and look at the high temperature part of it. And that's what was done in this particular paper with uh, Sashdev and Bilovanovich, okay? Because the condo effect is something that's beyond Hartree-Fock and that's not what, we are just doing Hartree-Fock, okay? So what happens is that if you start at high temperatures um, and you ask yourself, what is the best H effective that you're gonna get? What you find is that um, the equation is such that we can um, all, almost all, in fact, all the HIs, the best HIs turn out to be zero. Uh, there's no local field created at any point. That is the right answer at very high temperature. Temperature is larger than any energy in the problem, including you, okay? And so now we're gonna go come down in temperature. And as we come down in temperature, 
since all the H's are zero, we will just expand around H equal to zero. Uh, and so this, uh, the quadratic expansion is one can write down very easily. And what you get is a susceptibility matrix, uh, which involves these uh, Fermi functions of the eigenvalues of the self-consistent uh, uh, Hartree-Fock single particle uh, Hamiltonian. And then you ask yourself the question, um, what are these eigenvalues going to be, okay? So the matrix chi ij that I had in the previous slide, this one right here, which is explicitly given in terms of the eigenfunctions of the Hartree-Fock uh, uh, Hamiltonian, which, we, which is a one particle Hamiltonian, so we know how to diagonalize it for some, we went up to 300 or 400 sites, okay? So it, it's not a difficult task, 400 by 400 to do that, okay? And um, now what happens is that as you go down in temperature, one of the eigenvalues of the susceptibility matrix <laughs> becomes larger than one over U. And when that happens, this term becomes negative. Basically, you're looking at a matrix equation, looking at where you're getting a negative eigenvalue in the problem. Okay, so the effective, uh, when this thing becomes effectively negative, that's when you're gonna start getting a minus H squared term. And then of course, to actually find out what the field is, you'll have to go to H, order H to the fourth. We didn't do that. We just found out what are the uh, eigenfunctions of the magnetization for which the eigenvalue is turning out to be negative. Okay, all right. And by then we started looking at which, what are these eigenvectors of the, of the susceptibility matrix. So we now, now look at two different kinds of eigenvectors. We look at the eigenvector of the Hamiltonian, the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, and then we look at the eigenvectors of the susceptibility matrix. And we try to see whether these are extended eigenvectors or are these extended over the entire system or are they localized? And one way to check whether they are extended or they are localized is what is known, uh, you calculate what is known as inverse participation ratio. So if you have any eigenfunction psi, which is over all the different sites, then the inverse participation ratio for that eigenfunction psi is the sum of psi i to the fourth power over all the sites and divided by the normalization condition that psi i squared psi, uh, you know, uh, sum over all sides quantity squared. So if you uh, have unnormalized eigenvectors, you can still use this formula. If you have normalized eigenvectors, then the denominator here is just one, okay? Now, if you have a localized site um, eigenvector, then the, this value of IPR, as you increase the size of your system, is going to remain constant. It basically matches one over the number of sites over which the states are localized. So if it is localized over a finite number of sites, it'll go to a finite value. If it is localized over the entire system, as you increase the system size, it'll keep decreasing. So we looked at both the IPRs of the effective Hamiltonian near the Fermi energy and the susceptibility matrix. And what we found was, if you look at the inverse participation ratio as a function of size, this is a log log plot. What you find is that the inverse participation ratio for the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian of the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian decreases with size, suggesting that all the eigenstates are extended. So the, the one electron approximation, everything is extended. So this is a metal, not an insulator, okay? Of course, we did very small sizes. So you can say, well, maybe you, you know, it's, uh, the localization length is well, much bigger than your size and you're not really seeing that. that. That is certainly a criticism you can have. On the other hand, if you look at the participation ratio of the eigenvectors or susceptibility matrix, the M, of I, then it turns out that it doesn't seem to depend very much on, on, on size of the system at all. It does depend a little bit on temperature, 
Uh, here, the number is 0.75, which says that it's sort of roughly uh, localized on one and a quarter sites, so one and a third sites, so something like that. Uh, by the time you get to 0.01, which is a very low temperature, it's localized over two sites. So it has, you know, at low temperatures, and maybe it is uh, somewhat bigger, but it's very clear that it is not anywhere close to the 300 or 400 sites that we have in the system. So this is saying very clearly that the instability, the magnetization vectors that are unstable are very localized pointing to the fact that there are local movements happening. There are specific sites where there's an instability and it sort of stays in the vicinity of that site. It's not uh, diffusing over the entire this. So basically the implication of this um, plot on the left of, of the inverse participation ratio is that eigenstates of the susceptibility matrix are localized, they're local moments. Whereas the eigenstates of the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian are extended, suggesting that, the, that there are extended one electron states in the problem and you have a metal. So we uh, worked at a density that was about actually between one and two times the critical density. And what we found was that if we were at 1.25 critical density, which is one of the uh, concentrations in uh, Palanen's data, uh, we found that between five and 10% of the sites have local moments, or those, between five to 10% of the total eigenvectors are localized, okay? And such local moments could explain the strong temperature dependence uh, of the magnetic susceptibility beyond the metal insulator transition. Uh, uh, and so that's a question that, uh, um, that seems to be understood. But of course, as theorists, what we want to know is what's going to happen when it, we go to low temperatures. Because generally speaking, when you have a local moment in a metal, it gets screened out at a very low temperature called the condo temperature. And is that what's going to happen in this system? And that's a question we'd like to know. Uh, I should point out that it wasn't just Miko Palanen susceptibility data. There was another day experiment, a really fantastic experiment done by Ani Alul and his uh, student, Alain Deluwe, uh, that actually got published a year or so before Miko's uh, experiments were published, in which he used NMR to try and locate whether there were localized moments or not. What were, basically what he did was he looked at the night shift and if the system was itinerant, then the night shift would be some amount and he could integrate the, uh, the signal and find out how much, how much signal there was. If on the other hand, it got localized, then the night shift would be huge and out of the window, out of his experimental window. So he tried to find what the fraction of sites or a fraction of electrons in his phosphorus of silicon are actually in itinerant states. So he measured itinerant state rather than local moments. And what he found was it was 100% at a concentration of, uh, you know, eight times 10 to 19, way far away from the metal insulator transition. But as you approach the metal insulator transition, this number precipitously dropped. So in fact, he is, saying that a lot more than 10% are local moments, you know, because they may not be precisely one site local moment, they could be several site local moments, but they're enough that they don't behave like itinerant uh, electrons at all. And so that also was good evidence that there's something like a local moment formation was happening here in the system. Of course, in this system, you're gonna, because it's disordered, you're gonna have local moments at all length scales. And, Beyond a certain land scale, say the localization land scale, it's no longer a local moment. It's a, it's part of the Fermi liquid. But until then, it can act like a local moment. Robin, I just mentioned that something else that you can do with Hartree Fock that very much yeah. fits in with the picture you yeah. described. So you can look at it at zero temperature, right? right? In other words, below below you, Hartree Fock. Right. And you then get out the eigenfunctions, the eigenvalues, et cetera. And you have your local moments there, there. Right. And you can then take the wave function, the Hartree-Fock wave function, in the vicinity of the Fermi level, mm -hmm. and you can ask 
what is its distribution, its weight on the sites which you know carry the local moment? Right. Virtually none. Exactly. The sites that carry the local moments are really quite so. There's a spatially and homogeneous Fermi level state that sort of avoids the local moment. Right. I, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, I'm, uh, if you actually have a paper saying that, I, I would really, yeah. um, I, you know, that that's exactly fits in with the, with the kind of picture that we have. Because we want to next we want to ask the question, how is how is this how are these local moments going to get screened out at low temperatures, and it's precisely that spatial separation that stops it from getting screened out. Uh, so. Uh, what happened, uh, so this was all done in 89 or thereabouts, and then I started thinking about what to do, uh, how to handle the situation beyond Hartree Fog to low temperatures, and we, uh, we sort of didn't, as, weren't as uh, uh, brave as David to go and actually do the zero temperature calculation and try and see what one gets, but what we did instead was we put bounds. Okay, and this is a paper that I did with uh, Daniel Fisher, um, and is the question of what is the asymptotic low temperature uh, behavior of local moments? Do they get screened out like in a regular metal or not? Okay, so the question we asked is, do these local moments survive as temperature goes to zero, or do they get, and do they give a, a divergent susceptibility? So there are two, possible mechanisms for getting rid of local moments. One is you can have the conduction electrons, or in this case, the itinerant electrons, whatever disorder they may have, they can screen the local moment and form a singlet with the local moment and local moment disappears. That is what happens when you have a condo effect in, in metals uh, with magnetic impurities, uh, you know, very dilute magnetic impurities, but one also knows that if you increase the concentration of these impurities a little in metals, then there are what are known as RKKY interactions, magnetic interactions between them. Basically, it's the interaction between two spins mediated by the conduction electrons of the metal. So both of these uh, things could happen in our disordered metal. And so we had to figure out whether they were effective or not. Okay. So it turns out, I'll sort of give you the first the answer and then I will go through the whole argument. Uh, you know, I had a previous version of this, uh, this set of lectures, which was compressed into fewer lectures. So I didn't have the time to go through, uh, go through the full argument, but here I have two more lectures. So I'm going through the full argument. Okay. So in that pressy, I basically said that condo effect reduces the number of effective moments at low temperatures by a factor that that turns out to be that one in three dimensions, but that's not enough to cancel the one over T that is coming from the local moment. And so in the end, the uh, susceptibility diverges approximately in a power law fashion. It turns out if you go do the same uh, kind of treatment for the RKKY interactions, it, it turns out that it's more effective, but still it isn't enough to quench the susceptibility. And you get a form of the susceptibility at low temperature that's slower than any power law, uh, but nevertheless, it's divergent at zero temperature. I should also tell you that these are bounds. These are not uh, actual results, okay? Um, we are gonna make assumptions that whenever a local moment can get quenched, we'll assume it gets quenched. It may turn out that it doesn't quite get quenched. And then, so, so if anything, the real susceptibility is going to be larger than, the, than our bound. So, so long as our bound diverges, we know that the real susceptibility. So these are lower bounds? Uh, these are lower oh, bounds. Oh, wow. These are lower bounds. Okay. So what this says is the local moments must in principle be included in any description of disordered metals in principle. Now, of course, how much of an effect they have varies a lot and the last slide I, I will have uh, on today's talk will show you how different say phosphorus dope silicon is compared to an amorphous metal like niobium silicon alloys. But even they have local moments. We have uh, experimental evidence for that. 
So first, let me talk about um, can these local moments be quenched by condo effect? So I'm going to try and have a picture of these local moments. The picture of the local moments is that there is we have inhomogeneously distributed sites, and as you saw, that the the nearest neighbor distance can vary a lot from from one site to the other. So I imagine that there's some very rare uh, site that has no uh, no sites in a distance R from it. Okay. Now I'll tell you that this is a it's going to underestimate because there may be sites that are uh, that are less isolated, but where the where their neighbors are paired up, like in the insulator, and so they are not uh, magnetically active. But how we are interested in getting a lower bound, so we'll take the worst case scenario. We'll say that this site is actually completely has no neighbor up to some distance R. And so that probability is just given by the uh, Poisson probability. If you have a density N of sites, then the probability that there is no other site in the distance R is e to the minus four pi uh, NR cubed over three. Okay. So if you then, it would say that the susceptibility of an ensemble of such sites at low temperature is given by basically the number of them divided by T. And what we say is we want it to be such that we'll, we want the um, isolation of the site to be such that the condo temperature is lower than the temperature or equal to the temperature. So if the condo temperature is less than that, this thing is still acting like a local moment. So we put this equality and we know that the condo temperature is given by some uh, expression of the sort, uh, some electronic energy scale times e to the minus one over the density of states times the exchange interaction between the local moment and the conduction electron. But this exchange interaction is T squared over U goes exponentially with this isolation distance because this site is so isolated that it has no exchange interaction with any conduction electron, even if that conduction electron comes all the way to the edge of the sphere, okay? So if you do that, if you insist that this condo temperature is equal to temperature, then it immediately tells you that this distance, isolation distance at a temperature T that is needed is log of the density of states times log EF over T over two alpha, okay? I may have, you know, I've thrown away factors of four pi's and threes and things like that. I've just kept the functional form of the thing. And so then I put this RT into this expression here and I get a susceptibility that looks like uh, this log cube that I said divided by T and, uh, and it turns out log cubed of log of E over T. And if you then take the, uh, temperature going to zero, you can see immediately that this thing diverges, okay. And it turns out in general dimensions, all that happens is that you get power D instead of uh, 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 log cubed, you get log to the power D. That's, and it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter which dimension you're talking about, you're always going to get an infinite susceptibility from these very rare isolated sites. So how did that happen? I mean, why did such a small number of sites, they are really rare, but they dominate this magnetic susceptibility at low temperatures. And the point is that the, even though the density is small, they are coupled even extremely weakly. They are exponentially small in R, R to actually exponentially small in R cubed, but the condo temperature is the exponential of a positive exponential, negative exponential of a positive E to the, minus e to the r. So while a probability goes like e to the minus r cubed, the condo temperature goes like e to the minus e to the plus r. And this is a much faster function that, than that. And so the condo temperature is going down precipitously as the isolation distance goes up. So, 
net result that we get is that a chondrotype quenching is not going to solve the problem. We are still going to get a susceptibility that diverges, even though this is a metal. Okay. So the next thing we have to consider is RKKY coupling between moments. So we say that, all right, we've got these isolated moments that are isolated by some distance little r. And typically they will find a partner at some distance capital R, which is similarly isolated because if these sites are not very isolated, they will find partners earlier. So you should find similar partners uh, that can, uh, uh, you know, and we assume that even though the RKKY interaction, which is given by J square J is the coupling exchange coupling of this local moment with the conduction electron, and it's J squared over R cubed times the cosine function of two KFR. That's uh, we just take out of uh, um, Kittel's book. And um, it's oscillatory. That says that this RKKY coupling could be ferromagnetic or it could be antiferromagnetic. Now, what we want to do is bound. So we're going to assume that if the coupling is larger than the temperature, then, then it is, it's antiferromagnetic and it just uh, quenches. <coughs> Of course, that's not really true. Some of them will turn out to be ferromagnetic and therefore they will contribute. But what we want to do is find out what is the lower bound of the susceptibility. So to get the lower bound. Uh, hello. Hi, Ravin. Can I interrupt? Sure. Yeah, no, I had a question. This formula for the RK KY coupling is for uh, normal metals, which are not disordered. Right? Right. Now, I mean, but the, your metal is like highly disordered. Right. With lots of localized states and some excellent states and all. So isn't that going to affect your estimate of the RKK by interaction? Um, well, um, as one knows, these, uh, the J, uh, the K RKK by on average falls off exponentially, but the K squared does not because uh, because uh, it has a sort of a, the phase factor, the 2KFR has a random phase in it. But, no, that's true. but the point is, but your disordered metal technically doesn't even have a Fermi surface. I mean, so I'm saying I don't even know what KF means now for this highly disordered metal. Um, no? I, I would argue that in that case, this the RKKY interaction would be even weaker than what one would expect. Uh, uh, yeah, no, the bound, I guess, yeah, it would be probably weaker. Yeah, I, and I'm just, yeah. No, I, I, I'm certainly uh, very interested in finding out what are the corrections to RKKY as a function of when the disorder gets large. People have done calculations for a weakly disordered metal. There is a, there's a paper by Anu Jagannathan and, and Elihu Abrahams and Michael Stevens, I believe, uh, where they actually considered weakly disordered metals and came up with the answer. There's an old paper by now, uh, uh, well, the French um, uh, physicist, uh, Nobel laureate Dijen, where he said that for a, for a disordered metal, the RKKY interaction will fall off with the mean free path. And that actually turns out not to be correct. Uh, it is true that if you strictly take the average, it does fall off with the mean free path. But if you take square it up, and then take the average, then you get a one over R cubed average. I mean, the J squared or K squared average goes as one over R to the sixth. That survives. They showed that uh, perturbatively at least. So at okay. least- for so Anyway, so you're mostly depending on the pre factor and not so much on the cosine of K of R, I guess. No, I'm not dependent on cosine, no. Right. I'm, so, I'm dependent on the J squared and on the R cubed. R cubed, okay, all right. Uh, that's what it, uh, my estimate will depend on those two, because I'm going to assume cosine two kfr is one. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, so the idea is that you know you have to find um, a similarly isolated site with which you can pair up and form a singlet, and you don't always form a singlet. Uh, even if it's a disorder metal, I do believe that there are cases where you'll get ferromagnetic uh, interactions. 
And the way uh, you uh, estimate how far you have to go to find a, such a site, you just multiply the total volume that you have times the density of sites and say that the probability of having this site, which is isolated by distance r, that product is of the order of one. And as soon as you do that, you find a relationship between the separation capital R and the isolation distance little r. And that's given in this formula right at the bottom. So we're going to use that in trying to figure out how things are going to happen when you go lower in temperature. So here in this last uh, sort of slide in which I have uh, substantive stuff is um, that RKK by of course oscillate in sign. And even if they oscillate in some random fashion, we, we won't worry about that. We will assume that all RKK by interactions are antiferromagnetic. And whenever any such two isolated sites have an RKK by interaction that is larger than the temperature, then they form a singlet and disappear from the magnetic system. And that's going to be an underestimate of the susceptibility. Anything, any other, uh, either if the interaction is weaker or if uh, it is ferromagnetic, you will get a higher susceptibility. Okay. So with this assumption, we just have to then write down the susceptibilities, one over T times the probability of finding this um, isolated site. And now the only difference is this distance R sub T at at the temperature T is not the same as in the condo problem. It is given by requiring that the RKK by coupling at capital RT is of order temperature. And we already had a relationship that uh, relating the capital R to little r. So we can use that. And as a result of that, we can do a little bit more algebra and finally get a result that the susceptibility goes as exponential of a log to the power one third of one over t. Now three is exactly the dimension. So if it was another uh, dimension, it'd be log to the one, one over d of t naught over t. But this also diverges as t goes to zero. But you can, if you look at it carefully for any dimension greater than one, it diverges slower than any power law that is. So that is, a, of course, this is a lower bound. So the actual susceptibility could possibly diverge with the power law. We can't say anything about that. But what we can say is that it cannot be constant. Okay. So this, you know, uh, these last few slides are sort of a, uh, an exercise in, in doing rare fluctuation physics, basically. Uh, at, a, at a time when it wasn't considered that uh, that fashionable. The, the assumption always was that rare fluctuations don't really matter that much. You know, you should look at the bulk of the, uh, of the distribution, typical things. No, here is the tail of the distribution that's dominating the properties of the uh, ther thermal properties of the system, thermodynamic magnetic and thermodynamic properties of the system. So, when you go through these kinds of arguments, uh, what you find is that even in the metallic phase where the Hartree-Fock states are extended and presumably the system is a good metal, uh, there is a non-permi-liquid behavior at low temperatures. Susceptibility is diverging at T going to zero, gamma of T, which is the uh, coefficient of the specific linear specific heat is also diverging uh, as T goes to zero. And it's analogous to Griffith singularities in random magnets and spin glasses, for example, the long time dynamics is often dominated by rare regions of spins, which take a very long time to flip. Okay, so it's, it's really, uh, this is a, is a case where the thermodynamics itself is picking out rare fluctuations rather than uh, picking out typical behavior. Okay. So of course, how significant these effects Will be will depend on the microscopic de details of the disorder because it's really if you sort of go back and look at the temperatures the experiments look at and the distances that are involved they are not 
microns or anything like that, they, you're barely going to a thousand angstroms or a couple of thousand angstroms. You're never going beyond that. So it's still a microscopic and, and, the, and the general, uh, the lattice constant if you will is 100 angstroms. So you're going, you know, one order of magnitude more than the lattice constant. You're not going very much more than that, okay. So, um, a, of course, phosphorus dope silicon is really good or any dope semiconductor is really good because they're randomly distributed sites. And so it's maximally uh, random at, at the fundamental scale. Now, if you have alloys that you make, typically there are short range correlations, which will make it less random. I've often uh, told students to write, uh, you know, draw a random lattice and they almost anything that they draw is very much closer to a regular lattice than a random graph. Uh, it's very hard for us to picture random graphs. Uh, and nature is also like that. If you put niobium in silicons, there's some clustering of the niobium and uh, there's going to be short range, hard, hard sphere uh, contact issues. And so it's never going to be as random as an as a ideal gas. Here it is an ideal gas, literally an ideal gas because it's very dilute and it, uh, it's grown at high temperature where entropy is the most important thing. The interactions between phosphorus atoms are not important at all. So you get as close to ideal gas as you can in a solid. However, the statement that we made says that it should be true in for anything that has local moments. So we decided to, there was a, a group, I showed you data on the, uh, conductivity and tunneling density of states of niobium silicon uh, amorphous films uh, deposited at low temperature. So they were, they remained amorphous and didn't uh, make clusters. And um, um, uh, Letty Allen and Amico Palan uh, actually grew some bulk samples of this stuff. And then they measured the susceptibility of these uh, so the first thing I want to show you is actually this curve on the top right. That is the resistivity versus the inverse temperature. So low temperature is on the right side. So if you look at 5% niobium, uh, it's a clear insulator. 10% is also insulator. 15% actually is a metallic sample, even though, you know, of course, on this curve it, but it hasn't changed very much. And if you plot it on a linear scale, you can see that it's going to a finite uh, resistivity at zero temperature. And by the time you get 20%, it's a superconductor actually. It superconducts. Uh, so the question is, what does the susceptibility look like? Well, here's the susceptibility. At 5%, it has a power law dependence. Not unexpected because uh, you might expect niobium has one electron and therefore that looks like a localized spin. 10% uh, also looks the same. That's also insulating. 15%, which is clearly metallic. The metal insulator transition here, if you remember, was around 11.5%. That also seems to have a significant dependence on temperature. 20% also has a significant dependence on temperature before the, it becomes superconducting. So it's telling you that there are local moments in these systems also. Of course, the local moment number is very small. If you look at the Curie susceptibility, it is two to three orders of magnitude higher. Whereas in the phosphorus dope silicon case, the susceptibility was always factor of 10 or 20 below Curie. Here it's a factor of a thousand below that. So the, the number of local moments in this system is much smaller, okay? And you, you might say, well, oh, then this is the standard situation of some lo you know, local spin that's there that's uncoupled to anything. That's the, always the thing that's done. You, know, you subtract out a Curie susceptibility out of almost every metal that you, that you measure the susceptibility of and then say the rest of it is, is the metal. That one's just some uh, you know, bad uh, defect on the surface or whatever have you. Well, you can actually check that. You look at these magnetization of the curve of the, and you find the magnetization does not fit a Brillouin function. It's clearly not a Brillouin function. So it's suggesting that whatever these local moments are, they are, they are exchange coupled. 
And so the susceptible, the magnetization is not linear like in a metal and it's not Brillouin like for isolated spins. It is something intermediate, which is very similar to what happens in phosphorus of silicon. So even though we haven't done, weren't able to do that quantitatively, it's very clear that the same physics is taking place, but on a much lower scale in amorphous uh, niobium silicon also. And so presumably in almost every system that undergoes a metal insulator transition. So as I said, this was the shortest lecture I had, and we are going to change uh, in the next lecture, we're going to go away from metal insulator transition in, in dope semiconductors and other disordered systems and talk about localization and many body localization in the quantum Hall regime. But before I do that, since I have a few minutes, I'm going to show a couple of pictures uh, for, the, for your amusement. This is uh, Phil Anderson, who is, because of whom we, I'm here talking today. Uh, about this subject, he started it all. And this is uh, um, one of the various Nobel celebrations we had at Princeton over the last 20 years. This was a problem. My guess is it's Frank Wilczek and David Gross's Nobel Prize the dinner that we were at. And uh, even earlier than that, uh, here's a paper, uh, a picture of where Phil is explaining to Dan Sui and me in my house, uh, some physics or the other, <laughs> I can't remember what one, which one, but I thought it was appropriate because the next topic I'm going to talk about is quantum Hall effect and Dan is clearly giant in that field. So I thought that it would be amusing for people to see these two pictures uh, as I make the transition from, uh, you know, disordered systems uh, that are ordinary Anderson uh, mod localized to uh, disordered system that have a topological character. So I'm going to stop there, even though it's <coughs> I still have 15 minutes. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I had a question regarding your niobium SI data. Can you just go to that slide? Sure, absolutely. Two slides back. Yeah. Yeah. Now the the insulating part of this uh, magnetization, etc. Does that like, you know, because for the phosphorus doped silicon, you had a theory for M versus H as well, right? For the insulating and right. the insulating side. Yes. Uh, so does that, uh, do these functions look the same as that? Are they different or? I would say that they look very similar uh, qualitatively. They're, you know, basically they're somewhere between a Brillouin function which saturates and one that's uh, linear. Uh, one would expect that the asymptotic behavior at long, um, at large H uh, would have an ex, you know, a power law behavior where the power law exponent is related to, um, related to the uh, susceptibility power law exponent. So yes, I haven't done that, but I'm, my worry is that I, we don't have enough, uh, enough dynamic range to, definitely show that um but okay. it's so you're saying you're not sure that you'll the kind of approximations i mean like use this like the strong disorder rg might not apply in this particular case or what no i'm not saying that all i'm saying is that i personally believe it it should apply it's just that we don't have a microscopic model for the for the disorder in niobium. okay how the niobiums are distributed uh, because I, we don't know how, you know, how exactly the local, what are the local moments? Are they isolated niobium atoms with a bunch of silicon around it? Or is it some cluster of niobium that's causing the, uh, causing the local moment, some particular cluster? We don't have any of that information. Uh, but um, one of the things is that if, no matter what that uh, entity is, if we were to apply strong disorder RG to that, that kind of a system because they will presumably be exponentially, if they're exponentially localized spins, uh, they will have an ex exponential uh, interaction with distance. And then the same kind of physics should apply, which would say that uh, the susceptibility exponent, if I fit this to some t to the minus alpha, then this guy should go as h to the one minus alpha, I believe. Right, so that you can that has not been checked. 
that has not been checked. I think part of it was that um, I, I don't think we could go to high enough fields at that time. Uh, but it's, it's something that should be done. One of the problems is that all these niobiums and silicon, uh, they have to be vacuum sealed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pellet. And uh, because if they are not, then they oxidize and then I, everything goes out of the window. So it's much harder to deal with these animal, you know, all the data that were taken on transport properties by, um, by Bishop and, and Dines and Hertel, uh, they made the samples by, uh, you know, amorphous samples by uh, spraying niobium and silicon on a cold substrate and not allowing the, uh, keeping the substrate cold enough that the niobium and silicon atoms couldn't diffuse. So it's really uh, an amorphous, film that is not allowed to equilibrate in some way. It's, it's a, and if you raise it to high temperature and bring it back, it doesn't look the same at all. It, it looks very, very different. So it's a delicate uh, system. Most of these uh, go, you know, metal al uh, semiconductor alloys are not that uh, stable, let's put it that way. There's three alloys that I know that have been worked on. There's, the old one was gold germanium. That was done by Macmillan and Moschel. And the reason why niobium silicon was done was because the Bell Labs groups, of course, <coughs> felt that they could do a better job with, a, with something that was more stable. And then the Stanford group did molybdenum germanium, saying that maybe the niobium silicon is not so stable. But I think uh, if you look at the data overall, what you find is it's very similar. All three of them behave similarly. And all three of them have uh, uh, issues of stability that you must make your measurements at cold temperatures. And once you've heated it to room temperature, you can forget about the sample. So, so those, are, those are problems that still uh, plague this system. As you can see, this, is, uh, this data only goes up to 30 Kelvin. And that also, uh, basically all the data was taken at low temperature. And then we said, all right, we're going to, throw away the sample after these measurements. So then let's heat it and, and get the data at as high a temperature as we feel that it's not, the composition is not changing. And so that's where the data ends also. Any other questions that people might have? Could I? Well, if not, we can... Uh, we can Thank you. conclude today's session. And uh, uh, next week, I'll start with quantum hall effect and localization in the quantum hall regime, both many body and single particle. We'll learn something new there. <laughs>